Right. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for our uh, event here, uh, Protecting Diplomatic Security Worldwide. We have two very special guests with us today, uh, alumni of the University of South Carolina, Greg Sherman and Wendy Bashman. Uh, they're going to spend some time telling us about the Diplomatic Security Service. Uh, how many people are familiar with the already? Or so it's okay for now. Okay. Uh, I have been involved in criminal justice since 1986. And um, okay, I'll go ahead and admit it. Uh, the first I was aware of the Diplomatic Security Service was when they contacted me about the Um okay. So, I'm not trying to speak. But welcome them. Uh, they're going to tell us some, some things about the DSS and some things about the arc of their career. Uh, we like to do this to not only let you, let you know sure where they came from and how they got to where they are, so that you can kind of envision where your career might go. Okay. Expand that. Um, I think we want to do this as a bit of uh, an interactive experience. They do have a PowerPoint presentation they want to share with us. Uh, tell us some things about the DSS, but then after that, uh, I have some questions prepared that I'll share with you and, uh, and, and ask them. And I would encourage you to think about what, what questions you might have for them. Uh, we do have a special prize for those of you who decide to ask questions or actually the three things. All right, so please help me welcome. Okay, before we start, who's giving extra credit for being here today? Yeah, <laughs> we are because we're not in Washington right now. <laughs> oh, great. Well, Greg, why don't you start us off with the slides? We'll get through it. We promise that the death by PowerPoint will be as short as possible. Yeah, well, greetings, I'm going to stand up. We're yes. My mobile is stand up. We're not sitters. Wendy and I are both kind of high energy uh, people, I think. So, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So, well, greetings. Uh, as, as Brent said, my name is Greg Sherman, and uh, Wendy and I are both assistant directors in the Bureau of Diplomatic Security, which is the security and law enforcement arm of the Department of State. We'll walk you through that. Um, I think we've been on, I've been on, closing on 23 years, and Wendy on 25. Over 25. Over 25. Um, and I think both of us have, uh, would do it all again. 100%. And it's been a hell of a ride, and uh, to this middle class kid from San Diego, when I was talking earlier to a middle class kid from Charleston, we've seen things and gone to places and been a part of things that I've never ever thought possible here. And, and I will tell you that I went to undergrad in California. Wendy was happy, lucky enough to do both her undergrad and grad here at University of South Carolina. As far as that, I came to grad school here and it absolutely helped set me on my path to join the uh, Bureau of Diplomatic Security and do what we do today. So, I guess if you don't know about it, you can all read this. But again, as I said, security and law enforcement are of the Department of State. Um, it's comprised of engine, special agents like ourselves, um, but the diplomatic security focuses on the security of our personnel overseas is one of our main functions. To do that, it's not just agents like ourselves that have law enforcement functions and others. It's the buildings themselves and technical security and computer security, cyber, um, uh, couriers, you know, the old fedoras and the handcuff on the wrist carrying classified documents. We still have diplomatic couriers. They still do stuff around. They have bigger things now, they don't do that anymore. Um, and really over 40,000 people worldwide. It's a lot of our local nationals, local uh, uh, citizens from all around the world work on our embassies and we could not do our job without them. And, Wendy, what you think? Yeah, so Diplomatic Security is the law enforcement agency for the State Department. Uh, we have what we call three pillars, and you see them up here. So we work on criminal investigations, we do protection, and then we also do the threat analysis and technical and physical security, as uh, Greg was talking about. This is kind of an idea to show to you that it's not just about law enforcement officers with the State Department and with Diplomatic Security Service. We have people that do threat analysis. We have people that are engineers, both uh, computer engineers, as well as, because uh, I'm not an engineer, I don't know the categories that they have. Electrical. We have lots of engineers. Electrical, Electrical mechanical. Yes, there you go. Uh, STEM programs, we're looking for STEM students. Uh, and then we also have uh, accountants, believe it or not, for our criminal investigations, because we do a lot of forensic analysis on our criminal investigations to try to find money laundering and other assets that will have been uh, received during criminal uh, activity. That's pretty much it. And of course, everything nowadays is cyber, because everything is tied to the Internet of Things. And so it, it comes into play in our criminal investigations, it comes into play when we do protection, and then obviously it comes in when we're trying to secure our facilities and our locations. Yeah, 
so this kind of just outlines our law enforcement authority. This is a good friend of Greg and mine. This is NBA Singleton. Uh, a few years ago. Now. Yeah, a few, few years, years ago. Uh, but yeah, we do arrest. We have arrest authority throughout the United States uh, and the territories. Uh, and we can actually arrest people in foreign countries on the soil of the U.S. Embassy and the consulates, or what we would call diplomatic locations. Uh, if we have to do an arrest outside of those locations, we have to do it in concert with the host nation, the country that we're in. And I think one of the keys here, I mean, is the fact that while we're part of the State Department, we're Foreign Service officers. Okay. We are very unique in that regard. We are a foreign service officer. We are federal law enforcement officers. So it's the weeks and weeks of training at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe. Uh, it's our own follow on training, which Wendy oversees and leads and manages now as basic agents and before we go overseas. Um, but it's that you need hybrid for us. And so Wendy, I know, is a political science major, an undergrad, and then her master's here. I was an international relations major, and then my master's here. We have people, uh, I was a cop before I joined DS, Wendy was P and P here um, in Columbia. I've got a good friend who managed a gap before he joined the Department of State. I have another good friend, Maureen in Kabul, she sold insurance and stuff. So it's like, you know, I know a Secret Service guy, I think it was a rodeo clown before he joined the Secret Service at one point. I mean, you can, it, those things are neat and they help, but I mean, for at least for Wendy and I, I think it kind of was a good logical fit for us. But just if your majors aren't those things, it doesn't matter. I mean, whether you're an engineer or these other specialties, there's, I think, a great many opportunities, not just in DS, but in the Department of State. All right. Wendy already kind of did a lot of this. So domestically, it's you know the gun and the badge. We didn't bring them, just paying the buck to travel with them and all that stuff on the planes, even for us. But um, it's the gun and the badge. Criminal investigations largely focused on the State Department's documents and responsibilities, passports, visas. But those have been broadened out: human smuggling, human trafficking, big ones and stuff. Um, identity theft and identity fraud have been timed or other cases. The future of returns, Wendy mentioned, because we are in most every country overseas in a presence of anywhere from one or two to seventy. In places like Baghdad or Kabul, where we have tons of agents and stuff. So, whereas, I mean, everybody knows the FBI, everybody knows the DEA, and they may have a really heavy presence in one or two local, or several locations overseas. We're in places there in uh, Togo, I know, um, uh, Port Moresby, I mean, these places in New Guinea. So, um, also the thing we do, which makes us very unique and really only similarities with the Secret Service, is the wire in the ear of the protection, the bodyguarding. You'll see some photos here. I mean, uh, Wendy and I have had a chance to uh, safeguard some uh, some key moments and some key personnel, I think, in history. Shimon Perez, the Dalai Lama, and Nasser Arafat. We've helped with the president and vice presidents and secretary of state have come to our countries. We've helped ensure their security. Uh, and then overseas, really, is, I would argue, a lot of our bread and butter. It's protecting, helping our ambassadors lead foreign policy. How do we keep them safe? But it's a dangerous world. You don't read the press. You see the papers. You read the threats that happen overseas, the mob protests, the terrorist attacks. Our job is to help keep Americans safe overseas, official Americans at our embassies, at our schools and housing in particular, to let those people do their job. Yeah, so here's just a little bit uh, more on kind of the specialties within the agent corps. Um, so we, we talked about criminal investigations and we serve on the joint terrorism task forces that are run by the FBI. Uh, we're not on all of them because we are a small organization, so we can't go into all of them. But we're in the, the major ones and the ones that specialize in extraterritorial crimes um, because we have all of our people overseas. Uh, and then we also do fugitive tax forces. Um, human trafficking is really big and significant. Uh, we're not so much in smuggling, but smuggling can come into play. Uh, and then, of course, we have tactical teams, just like every other federal law enforcement, and nowadays every state and local law enforcement element. That's where we do technical security uh, tactics, usually domestically when we're doing protection uh, for the Secretary of State or a visiting dignitary that has a high threat or critical threat. And then, of course, counterintelligence. Um, everybody knows that everybody spies on everybody. Um, and uh, with that, there is a need to protect our national security interests. So a big part, and kind of the difference, what makes DS unique is one of the few federal law enforcement agencies that are actually allowed to investigate their own espionage cases. Many times we do it in concert with the FBI, but we can actually run our own counterintelligence cases 
um, against uh, both foreign nationals as well as uh, U.S. government personnel working overseas. Right, I think here, so uh, when you kind of touched on a lot of it, I mean, you can see some of these photos are in uh, some of the more austere environments, Afghanistan, Iraq, elsewhere. That was a guy in an American photo of a young me uh, looking like an idiot there in front of the Air Force Two or one, whatever it was in Guatemala. It was actually a lot of the cop. I don't know why. It just happened to have it right now. Being cool. I think it was a blow pop. I like I have a sweet tooth. I mean, I can't say. Again, at the forefront of protecting American diplomacy. For those of you who are maybe old enough, or if you've read it, the USS Cole was bombed in aid Yemen in October 2000. I was there about 30 days later. I stayed about 45 days. Um, you know, we have diplomats uh, and diplomatic security agents, colleagues of mine, that, are, that have been up until recently safeguarding a few select diplomats doing some crazy, insane diplomacy in Syria. Um, we do day trips into Libya, when these tactical agents that lead a lot of that. Day trips into Yemen, a place where we have shut our embassies down. But yet, the Department the Foreign Policy, the National Security Council of the United States says it's important that we go there and represent our interests, countering Russia, countering China, counterterrorism missions, and our diplomats need to get in, our senior leaders and engage. So DS agents are the ones working largely with the interagency community, a lot of DOD support, I think, for these. But you know, wide variety of programs, you need law enforcement, I don't think there's an organization that can only count us. Yeah, and I would say the, the thing that again makes us unique is for a diplomatic security agent or a foreign service officer, so even if you're not interested in law enforcement, but you're interested in the foreign service side, you get a new job every two to three years. That means you get a new boss, too. Some of my colleagues that work in other agencies, if they have a bad boss, they have to leave because that boss never leaves, right? So for me, I've had 25 years with the State Department, but it's been like, if you do my resume, it looks like I've had 18 different jobs. But it's actually all one job. But it's also what's made it a career, not a job. So I tell people on a regular basis, including new recruits who are just starting out in DS, I tell them, I hope that 25 years from now, they still love getting up in the morning every day as much as I do. I have never, and I, I'll be honest, swearing to God, never felt like I had to get up and go to work. I have always wanted to go to work. And I have friends that graduated me from the University of South Carolina, and they dread going to work. And I listen to them, I hate to say it, many of them are in insurance for some reason, but, and they sit there, but they have to work, right? They're not independently wealthy, they've got to support families and everything else, and you know, dogs and cats and cars and bunks and everything else. But for me, I mean, they'll see pictures of what I'm doing, and they hate me, and then they love me at the same time because then they come and visit me. So uh, it's different from other agencies and organizations in that. And it's a great way to experience the rest of the world in a lot of different cultures. So one of our primary missions uh, is protecting four dignitaries, protecting select key U.S. dignitaries, including the Secretary of State. Um, uh, former, once the Secretary of State leaves, we can protect them for up to six months. But really our dignitary protection mission is the Secretary of State domestically and visiting foreign dignitaries below the rank of head of state. Secret Service is going to protect presidents and prime ministers largely unless they decline it and they said we don't really clean it up. We're protecting, you know, Yasser Arafat, that was me down there uh, again, another flattering photo. Um, Yasser Arafat looks like he's my best friend there. That was January 1998, so we didn't recognize the Palestinian Authority as a nation. So he was the chairman of the PLO. So we protected him as a dignitary, but not a head of state. The UN Secretary General, when he or she travels to the United States, foreign ministers, defense ministers, royalty. Um, so this is, the Dalai Lama is one of, our, one of our favorites. I think I'm the only DS agent who does not have a picture with the Dalai Lama, because when, when I guarded Boston years ago, he was I was doing other things. I had a photo with him and stuff. But I mean, uh, of course, the Secretary of State of the world, and they can globe trot. Yes. They can blow trot. So anyway, there's one of our one of our hugest missions, um, uh, the protecting of not only the Secretary of State and his or her family uh, as warranted, but also visiting court dignitaries in the United States. Yeah, and again on dignitary protection, we also do special events. So domestically, uh, we participate in what they call the national security special events categories. There's our tier one, tier two, and tier three events. Uh, up here, you, down here you have the General Assembly for the United Nations in New York. 
uh, that's me and the Security Council when the Security Council is recessed. Obviously, I'm not allowed it otherwise. You've got a control command center, looks like some sporting event, and then of course you have the Duke and the Duchess um, when they came. Uh, we also protect uh, the U.S. athletes and uh, specta U.S. spectators for Olympics abroad. Um, the next time the U.S. will have the Olympics will be in Los Angeles. And that will be an interagency event, national security special event. And of course, DS will actually be participating. In that situation, we won't be focusing on the U.S. athletes. We'll be focusing on foreign teams that will have a critical so for me, when I joined in 94, I was all excited. It was 1996, many of you weren't even born yet. Uh, we were getting ready to host the Olympics in Atlanta, and I was all excited for that. And then I blew my knee out snow skiing, and then I spent the next eight months rehabbing as fast as possible so that I could actually work the Olympics in Atlanta. And I actually was part of the protective detail for the Israeli team. So I was in Atlanta for almost two months because we did the Olympics and the Paralympics that follow on after the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, again, a lot of our individual protection. Uh, Wendy, I think in the phone on the bottom left, it was, uh, what was that? That's Beijing. I was a deputy Olympic security coordinator for the U.S. team and the uh, U.S. sponsors for that. So I was actually in Beijing, China for two years sucking up all the carbon monoxide so that when all the guests came, the air would be clean. Right. And this is actually a closing ceremonies. Uh, a few of us uh, DS agents were invited to come out with, with the team for the closing ceremonies. For those who watch the Olympics or care about the Olympics, the closing ceremony is the fun one. The opening ceremony, where gives all the pomp and circumstance, is the boring one for athletes because they have to stand, they're not allowed to have any fun. The closing ceremonies, it's like a drunk fest. On the field. Yeah. So, up at the top right, I think that's Edison Cobble. I could be wrong. Um, you know, just talking about protecting people overseas. And then uh, the Attorney General uh, under Bush 43, Alberto Gonzalez, uh, when he traveled abroad. And then just our diplomatic missions overseas. So, again, the, the State Department doesn't exist for security, but security is a critical component of what the State Department does overseas. So, whether it's our national security priorities, foreign policy, we are there to enable that diplomacy to happen. So there's the priorities by the president and the National Security Council, Secretary of State, and the others, and stuff. So you can see here, um, especially for overseas, we're called regional security officers because we've traditionally had a responsibility for multiple countries. Thankfully, we're staffed now in large. We only have one country, which is enough. Um, massive, important interaction with the host nation. You see the bottom, and that's in Kenya, uh, with a former agent of ours, senior agent. Um, the host nation is not just them and their obligation to protect us and our embassy, but how are we enabling and empowering them? So we have some training programs that the Department of State runs, and Wendy coordinates several of those to our training side. Uh, they're trying to build the capacity of these folks to protect us, but also to fight the bad guys themselves, right? One fun stop overseas before they come back to the United States. Um, I think that's a big title in the middle there on the right. Um, Marine security guards, Marine, United States Marine Corps has had a relationship with the Department of State going back to 46, I believe, formally, the first MOA. So Marines have traditionally been responsible, you know, the United States Marine in his blue, nice blue uniform there inside the embassy. When you come in, checking people out and uh, letting them in or letting them out, that role has expanded to some degree as we become, quite frankly, have bigger targets overseas and more danger. The Marines now have a role that can help us with larger kind of compound defense, but really they're there to protect that innermost sanctum of our embassy and the personnel that are there. But it's a critical relationship. Um, and really, ultimately, you are that security advisor to the ambassador. He or she wants to make a move up country to some part of uh, Uganda, and you're going to advise them, or, okay, we can do that. And I need about a week's notice. I need a four deployed armored vehicle pull up there. I'll have to send my local investigator up two days in advance. We'll have a full security detail on you, and the host station police are going to be there. You're, you're thinking through these kind of security logistics for the ambassador and things of that nature. Yeah, and then this is uh, why we do what we do, uh, especially overseas. These are fairly recent events. Uh, many of you have heard about the two, what was one continuous attack really in Baghdad uh, against one gate at our embassy and then on the next day at the second gate. Um, this is where our physical and technical security really shine, as well as for me being in the training center. So I teach use of force. This is what I do. I mean, we, we give our agents guns. But then we also have to give them judgmental uh, training as well. And Jeff Albert, Albert will be very happy to know 
one that I didn't learn something when I was in graduate school, and that if we're going to teach people marksmanship, we also need to teach them judgmental. The other element is the State Department, we need to have less than lethal, too. Not everything can be uh, shooting someone to kill. And with Baghdad, most recently, this was one of the things that was surprising to me and many others at the State Department. So when they breached our gate, right, so they set tires on fire, this is something that we're still working on how to mitigate. So they pack a bunch of tires up against the door of the entrance, they light it on fire, and if anyone's seen tires on fire, they burn forever and very hot. And the doors that we do are designed to last for one hour. We call it a 60-minute forced entry ballistic door or window. When you light a tire beside one of these and it's going to burn for hours and hours, I don't care what company you're with, no one can combat that. Um, so they get in, and they did typical when someone breaches in a compound, they started acting like uh, uh, angry tourists. Yeah, well, not tourists, but you know how when someone breaks into a Walmart or something like that, they start just trying to steal anything and everything. We have video where you can see them breaking into a, a metal box where we had first aid kits, and you can see him grabbing the first aid kits and kind of dancing around all excited, and I'm like, oh great, we got galls and band-aids, and then they go running off, and it's like, okay, but what happened once they were on the compound is they didn't really get very far from our doors, because we had our team there, and what we were doing was we were firing back, obviously using uh, tear gas, the tear gas, honestly, people know they just don't even care about tear gas, they kind of laugh at you when you shoot it, but we were shooting them with rubber bullets. And has anyone ever been shot with a rubber bullet? It hurts. And they get shot about twice. They gotta be on the way. Well, the next day, the press in Baghdad is writing up and actually applauding us, the Americans, for using less than lethal as opposed to just shooting them dead, which we had the right to do, um, when their own security forces would not have done. Because the Iraqi security forces have just gone in and shot them dead. So, from that standpoint, I look at it as that's a win win. Um, but yes, we had a big mess to play up afterwards. Yeah. Well, I'm going to write that. The, the key takeaway for us here with the Baghdad in particular is the host, the host government failed us and abandoned us. The Vienna Convention obligates the host government to protect us. We don't have a thousand police in Baghdad, the Iraqis do. So the fact that they let them beat on our outer walls for 30 plus hours and that we did not have to use the force is remarkable in a massive way. Um, that could have gone incredibly differently in all the leadership and judgment of our, not only our senior agents there, but the embassy leadership is what saved us from a really worse day. So, all right, we'll get this. so that's kind of the professional side of what we do. We'll kind of give you a little bit now of some of the some of the interesting things that we've seen in our career. So it kind of goes out saying being a witness to history, right? Um, you were overseas and you are, or domestically, even overseas, I think, in particular. Uh, senior level US government officials are there to make history. They're there to sign agreements. They're there to further engage diplomacy and push the US national interest. So that was me and Barack Obama in 2009, and that was me and Nasser in 1998. Uh, and then Wendy's got the Bush 41 and 43 there. Yeah, this is Wendy between the Bushes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Get clean in here now. Uh, and uh, that was in Cairo, Egypt. That was before W uh, had declared that he was going to run for president. Uh, I don't, that would have been, I guess, 96, 5? No, 96, 97, thereabouts. And then, of course, that's me with the uh, part of the swim team, US swimming, uh, before the Olympics when they were coming in doing a lot of their pre races. So you see uh, Michael Phelps, uh, Ryan Walk, um, I actually can't remember the other two ladies. Um, you know, people say, what's the defining moment that you have in your career? So, I love sports. Pretty much all sports, okay? My father was a sportscaster, so I grew up watching and um, being pulled along to go see sporting events. So I'm at the Olympics. I've spent the last two years watching the development of the the stadiums and the arenas and working with the Chinese on the security plans. And uh, of course, Michael Phelps wants to break the record for gold medals in a single Olympics, right, in swimming. 
and then we realize that he actually has a schedule that's going to allow it. This means that he will be able to do his preliminary heats, go into the finals, and still be able to meet all the ones that he wants to do. So he starts swimming, and he wins his first gold medal, and then his second gold medal. And after about the second day, the Chinese are coming up to me, and they're like, this is crazy, right? Because the media are all over him. The Chinese people are all over him. The volunteers are all over him. Well, we have two things. One, we want to keep our athletes safe. We don't want any crazies to come out. Two, we don't want any opportunities for anyone to tamper with anything that he is drinking or eating. Okay, because doping is really big. Okay. And then three, we want this professional high performance athlete to perform. So, uh, I come down and, and we had two agents that were working the, uh, the water cube. So we were actually also, uh, we had to augment the team. So I was over there and I would come out on the days that he was swimming and watch him swim. So I was there for gold medal three and then four and then five and then six. So on seven, I'm actually standing poolside watching him swim. And then everybody's going, oh, he's not okay. I'm like, this is all jeans. Everybody in the world wants him to do this. There's no way he's going to do it. So I'm standing poolside on number eight. And I see him touch. Now I'm watching it on the board, just like everybody else. Um, to me, that's a defining moment in someone's career, where you get to see something that's truly historical. So people, I don't think that can ever be done again with the way they do scheduling. It was just amazing that the schedule worked out. Plus, I don't know that there's another athlete that actually wants to try and win eight. Because then I don't know if it should be done for nine, because everything's about breaking a record. Anyway. So it's not a quote, cool travel kind of speaks for itself, right? Do we have any average uh, questions with that? Yeah, they got to play. Oh, yeah, that's, that's great. That was Afghanistan. I was there for a year, 2008, 2009. You've never heard Cha Charan, and you'll never go there, I hope. But uh, uh, I hope an experience to be in Afghanistan for a year in 2008, 2009. Um, trying to help protect our diplomats in one of the most insane environments we could ever try and operate in, uh, which is our foreign policy. Um, and that's me, uh, fairly recently in Somalia. So again, uh, so I'm, if you read the bios or saw, I'm the direct, uh, assistant director for high threat programs. What does that mean? That means all the bad spots in the world are embassies I'm worried about. So your Yemen's, Iraq's, Libya, Syria, wherever and stuff. There's like, like 20, 30 or so of them, plus some other programs. And so I've, the Somalians when I had to visit to go look at our embassy there, so it's incredibly small. It's built like a bunker. It's not an all traditional embassy, but we have important foreign policy goals we want to accomplish in Somalia, try and stabilize it, try and keep Al-Shabaab in check, et cetera, et cetera. So our ambassador there, our agents there, kid and friends of Wendy's and mine, are trying to do the job. It's so whether you're doing it in London or Somalia, you're trying to help enable further diplomacy. Um, anybody words in the middle of Oh, that's again uh, 1996 Atlanta. That's the women's basketball team. Over on the far right, that's Lisa Leslie. Yeah. Nice. Again, y'all have done more with you in basketball, but Dawn Staley was part of this team that won the gold medal. So she's not in that picture. And then there's the, uh, the personal side of our travel, I think. So when, when you're assigned overseas, whether it's in the Persian Gulf or in Latin America or in Asia or in Europe, you're working five days a week. You work the normal U.S. government schedule, but there's not only the American holidays of July 4th, or something like this, but there may be a local holiday. And as opposed to flying from here to Australia, which is a lot of money, if you're already in Singapore, say, where I was, get to Australia is somewhat more affordable. Or something to Thailand and the place in Portland. So you get a chance to see and do some pretty remarkable stuff. I mean, there's when you speak turns, that's me in Angerwak, Cambodia, where you're on cross to rate for criminal life, that thing. Uh, sorry, Wendy. Um, <laughs> And that's me, Morocco, on the camera over there. Actually, there's another photo of me later on another camera. I'm much more comfortable here. That's why I was terrified, I think. And when you were here, So, uh, in the left, this is uh, Pisa, Italy. I'm always trying to represent the University of South Carolina. So, I have Gamecock stuff on everywhere I go. Uh, and then uh, in the middle of her is uh, what used to be called the Tiger Temple in Thailand, in Kanchanaburi. Uh, I think they actually closed this down. But it was a Buddhist temple that used to. Uh, take in tigers that had been either abandoned, um, mothers poached or whatever. It eventually got too big and the government actually shut it down, but you could actually go there and pet tigers and get scratched and stuff like that. Um, but it was really cool. 
stuff you can't do in the U.S. Do. This is like a Pulp Fiction, the dead and scrolling fronts or something like that. I, mean, this, I don't think this list is inclusive for us. This is no, this is not inclusive, but it wasn't designed to kind of give you an idea of all the different places. And it will pop back up in a minute, so it should. Did you plug it one more time? And you don't know, you may know some of them, you may not. Uh, Started alphabetically, yeah. then changed up. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is all over the world. Yeah. And then here we go. Okay, over here. So, yeah, it's kind of funny, right? Uh, I, asked, I was in Iraq recently talking to all of our agents and all of our security engineers and our cyber security staff and everyone in the senior agent there, the one who leadership on December 31st and January 1st kept us from killing three or four hundred Iraqis, thank God. Um, but we would have done it if we had to defend our embassy. Uh, it was not going to be another terror on. Um, I asked him, I said, Brian, uh, we joined together. Did anybody ever think I'd be assistant director? He goes, no. I said, yeah, see, you never know where your career is going to you, know, you, you don't plan this. You don't plan this. You, you hope to take jobs that are career and that are enjoyable, number one, that you want to do, and that make you competitive to be for leadership positions and greater challenges. And the rest is almost kind of something fate to some degree, I think, for both of us. Yeah, but I think you also want to go to places that your family will be successful and enjoy it as well. And I think that's a big part of this. Yeah, I can do more. Yeah, yeah. No, I have a son who's a uh, freshman away to Mary now, and a daughter's a junior in high school. He was born in the, in the, in the, in the Sultan of Milan. Um, you know, they, they, it's strange. He Boy Scout camped in Normandy. Uh, he and my daughter both learned to ski on a glacier in Austria, taught by Navy SEALs. Um, I mean, it's just crazy stuff. I mean, they, they uh, we bungee jumped in New Zealand. Um, you know, they, they, there's just, a picture of that. You can see that. Yeah, it's pretty funny. I mean, not my kids and stuff. So it's, uh, anyway, so DSS, right? When you hear that, most like Department of Social Services, that's what people think, right? This is, this is, so no, of course, we told you before, who knows the most famous representation of DSS in like uh, pop culture movies? Not the dead guys in Patriot Games that failed to protect, you know. They don't know the guys. Not, okay, how about U U.S. Marshals, Tommy Lee Jones, what, not the guys. Well, so you'll know. You'll know this one. There you go. Dwayne <laughs> Rock Johnson, yes. right? DSS. And that's, I think, Pastor is five or six. Yeah, we've been trying to get The Rock to come to some of our recruiting. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Pretty hard to get in touch with. He has a production company, and actually, he's doing, um, looking to do some sort of uh, short series, like, Documentary, I think, maybe drama based things, and he's actually talking to our public affairs about it, so he knows about it, which we're pretty glad about and stuff. So, I think that, there we go. There you go. So, that is the official so portion. Anyone ask, tell our public affairs office that we went through the presentation. That would have to be our public notice. Yes, I will pull up the That's kind of the end of our official presentation. We've got some other slides that we'll scroll through um, as we sit here and hopefully answer questions. I think just generally went down and go say the brother we've been domestic in the jobs and the probation parole and the cop and then a DS. I think law enforcement's a calling. Uh, I think service is a calling. Um, there, any, you could be a, a meteorologist in the United States government to serve. I mean, you know, you can in the State Department. We've got every career field there is: economics, political analysts, intelligence analysts, construction engineers. I mean, you name it. It's the whole nine yards and stuff. Um, so it's. Uh, I think a pretty wide open career field, and um, we can take questions. And stuff. Yeah, no, I, I will just say this about public service. Um, you know, nowadays, now I would say for the last 20 years, there's been a really big push to honor and respect military personnel who are serving or who have served, and, and that is very important. I mean, we've been fighting a global war on terrorism now for like two decades. Um, but there are a lot of public servants who serve just as much as a military uh, officer or enlisted person. Uh, and if you put on a badge and a gun or carry a stethoscope and a uh, band-aids uh, or drive around in a fire truck and put out fires, those are noble causes just as much. And people used to ask me why I joined DS, and I said, well, first of all, I don't look good in a uniform, so I wanted to be in law enforcement, but I didn't want to have to wear a uniform every day. So I can tell you right now, um, 
most federal law enforcement agencies in the U.S. don't have uniforms, so we just wear suits. Um, and the great thing about DS is we are kind of anonymous. A lot of people don't know who we are. They see the wires coming out of our ears, or they see us carrying badges, and they automatically think we're Secret Service or FBI. And you know what? We let them do that because if we do something wrong, that's why I just went through Secret Service. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so who has questions? All right. We'll start in the back. Come forward. Yes. So, yes, I'm still trying to learn English. Um, I have not quite mastered that one yet. I don't have, I found out while learning Mandarin that I'm tone deaf, so that didn't work out very well. I've, I've studied Egyptian, I've studied French, I've studied Spanish, I've studied Mandarin. I failed miserably at all of them. Um, I don't agree with the ones you've taken, but I'll say this. Uh, all federal government is looking for people that speak other languages. It's very important. It's very useful. The harder the languages, the better. But I think all languages are good. Um, and if you took something in college or high school and you have a, a desire to continue to learn that, the State Department actually has a school of languages and they actually put you through language school and they will actually get you to a level that both uh, in the federal government is considered what they call uh, fluency, right? So, and they have different stages of it. But usually when you get a grade three, that's where you're considered to be fluent, where you can have a conversation, not just ordering a cab, how to go somewhere, but actually have a conversation on economy or politics or something like that. A cocktail party, because you know that's what works on this whole Yeah, I think uh, for the federal government, I agree with Wendy. My good friends were seniors in the CIA. They say, look, you don't have to know a language fluently coming in, but the fact that you've taken one and shown some aptitude is a big deal for them. That helps. Um, same thing for us in the Department of State. Actually, if you come in with a certain proficiency in some language, you actually have a financial boost when you join as well. I mean, but I would say, really, the most important thing as far as languages, and what you kind of joked about earlier, speak, read, and write the Queen's English well. Interview well. Write your essays well when you apply, because a lot of these are like 45 minute timed essay on this topic, right? I mean, so that's important. But foreign language, I mean, I, if you have an aptitude for it, I've taken and studied done well in both Spanish and Romanian. I studied Spanish all my life growing up. I learned Romanian in six months where I went off to Eastern Europe and stuff. They're both similar languages, romance based. I'm pretty decent at languages, but I don't like to look forward to studying them. Um, but that is an aptitude that's important, I think. So it's an, it's an aptitude that's good. It, it's only going to help if you come in. Sure, if you've got Mandarin, there are three other agencies that are going to beat down your doors to offer you a job on the Mandarin, as long as you don't have like a massive criminal history or something. But for the most part, yeah, languages can only help you. All right. Yes. Places, but 
it's what you make of it. Um, I tell everybody, you can live anywhere. Anywhere. I, I, I agree with one of you across the board, um, but one of the problems that she and I both face, uh, you know, you're going to find anywhere in the government, anywhere else, personnel challenges. Employees that are either aren't doing their job, you have to hold them account. No one likes confrontation, right? But you've got to hold them account and work through those things. That's going to be true in the State Department, in any federal agency, in any private sector agency, right? I would argue that it's harder for us in some degree because of the protection that so many of our employees have as civil servants and government employees. You can't get rid of some of the ones. I would argue we should. Um, the other piece I would speak to personally, one of the challenges, is going to be on the family, right? Our embassy life, working overseas, not, it's long hours. It's hard. So if you have a spouse, if you have children, you know, just sometimes we live in places where you have to have 24-hour armed guards outside your place and a panic room in your house because crime is so bad in some of these countries and residential burglaries are so violent, it's that bad. I personally was never willing to take my family to a post like that. I was willing to go to a one-year Afghanistan a one year Yemen or a place like that. I, we would, my wife, God bless her and stuff. I'm going there and a picture of her. If you anybody noticed in Thailand, if you read down in her shorts, it said Rally Cat. So she did go to Clemson. But she also went here to grad school, which is where we met. So she's got a split loyalties. But God bless her and her tolerance and stuff. I mean, so I would argue some of the strain on being far from your family is if you're a 36 hour flight and your mom has a heart attack, that's hard. That's hard. So, you know, fix separation, yeah. parts of it, and some of the challenges on your family. Uprooting. From the town they've grown up and lived in all their life in Grand Rapids or St. Louis, and like, hey, we're moving to Bamako, Mali. Like, where? Yeah, that's where we're going. So uh, that, that's one of the challenges I would say. But it's you work through it. Positions that we have the Forest Service position or the Civil Service positions. You know, there's a job description that's listed. I encourage you that you answer the questions on USGA jobs to the to the position description, right? Not to what you think it's going to be, but to the position description. The other thing is really highlight work experience. Uh, now, I'll be honest with you, my work experience when I applied, I was a graduate assistant. I worked for probation, parole, and services, and before that. I mean, I, I wait waitress, I mean, that was my work experience. But it's also how you sell that, because there is a branding and a selling that you have to do for yourself. And I remember applying and they said, well, all you've done recently besides being a probation parole officer was is you did uh, your graduate assistant. And you, I said, well, graduate assistant? I said, that's investigations right there. Professor Albert would give me a task. I, this was before the internet, mind you. I had to go to the library and look things up. I said, well, that's an investigation. So it's how you sell it. Um, the other thing is really be prepared when you pass the different, because there's written tests, there's online tests, there's essay tests. Kind of prepare yourself put, so you don't walk in the first time of doing it. Now, if you want to join the regular Foreign Service, there's a thing called the Foreign Service Exam. It's still going on. Um, and that is a test, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it used to be when I came on, 80% of the people that took the Foreign Service test failed the first time they took it. Those um, weren't failed. Yeah. It, it's just because it's different. And I don't know how much has changed lately, but I still think it's, it's maybe the, the odds are a little bit better. But the second time you take it, because you've taken it the first time you know what to expect, a lot of people pass it. Uh, but that's just the first step, because you will have a written exam, and you will have an essay, and you will have an oral exam. Oral exam is where you're really going to sell yourself to those recruiters that are standing there because they're going to sit there and they're going to ask you questions to see one if they can shake you, if they can see if they can get you to bite on something, right? Try to get you to talk politics. Foreign service officers don't like talking politics, especially nowadays. Um, and then they're going to see how you handle yourself in a difficult situation. So they'll do a little bit of uh, role playing and that type of thing. Back in the day, we had this exercise doesn't make any sense nowadays, but they called it the inbox exercise, you know, how to prioritize what you would do for the day. Hopefully they stop doing that. So I think when Wendy, when Wendy and I both joined, she and I joined, I would assume, DS's recruitment ended up filtering through about a third part former law enforcement, 
about a third former military, about a third from Hunter Peter, though, so private sector, university, whatever it is and stuff. Since we've been at war for 18 or 19 years, the, and the veterans' preference for hiring, that has definitely skewed, I think, the preponderance, 50% plus one at least, of our classes has a lot, has military experience. Four years, eight years, 10 years, whatever it is, right? And also, I think they get a bump in the maximum age they can be. For most of us, it's 37, but I think if you're a veteran of enduring freedom or Iraqi freedom, it's up to 42. So, I joined at 26. When y'all were you doing? 27. 27. So I've been an undergraduate, a grad student, and a cop here in Columbia, South Carolina. But that was my work experience, right? I'd intern for a congressman, I'd intern at U.S. Marshals, not all health and stuff. But that was what got me the door in, in 1996, 1997. Nowadays, I think our average age is slightly higher. Because mm -hmm. there is that experience people have had two, three, four years as a police officer, as a probation parole officer, as a corrections officer, as a sheriff, selling insurance, whatever it is, dealing with people and interacting. But the, I think it's, it's fair to say the military veterans preference is skewed a lot of our, not a bad way, but just as a fact of so many people who are veterans are coming out of the GI Bill, going to university, that have time in the military, and the veterans preference is, a, is an act of Congress, so that, that helps them in the hiring. They still have to pass the oral, all the things when you said. That gets them to the door. They still have to pass the oral reviews. They still have to show they can write and not sputter out sentence fragments and all those things. So We've yeah. actually changed it now. The veteran's preference is done at the end instead of the beginning. So everyone is treated the same in the beginning through the process. Uh, and it's just at the very end as the, uh, the military preference comes in uh, with a slight bump. What else? In the back, young man. Uh, not well. Oh, no. I do it superbly. Okay. Um, so work-life balance is uh, harder to come by. I think the higher you go, at least for me, I'll be honest. Um, I work out every morning about 5 a.m. Uh, and that is a critical part of me not not going nuts. Um, you know, I'm older now than I used to be, and it's harder to do all those things. But it's an important part. Uh, I still get a little quality Xbox time on the weekend, I'll be honest with you. I'm not ashamed to say that. I got a little quality me time to decompress. Uh, no, I'm not going to tell you who my name is. I don't put the microphone and that crap. Uh, but, um, it, you know, being able to balance and keep it in perspective, right? At the end of the day, I think we're not, it's a calling, it's a career, it's a job, but I, I think the most family comes first. You know, you have to keep that perspective. Your loved ones, those who have cared for you and you care for now, that's where it's at and stuff. But I think, I mean, when you know I've been blessed or cursed to be in this position, it's a pretty serious responsibility. Um, you know, we take those jobs very, very seriously. We're in incredibly serious deliberations every day on things that are life and death uh, for people overseas. Are we going to approve this mission or are we not? Are we going to tell this part of the State Department we cannot? Anyway, so that, I mean, it's, it is incredibly hard. Everyone's got to find their way out of when you so I describe this to, to new agents when they're coming in, when I'm talking to them, because everybody talks about work-life balance, everyone's heard this. So people think of a balance, they think of it as straight across. So I can tell you right now, that doesn't exist anywhere. A balance is a scale, and there are going to be times where work is going to take more of your life than your family life, and there are going to be times where your family life is going to take more than your work life. For me, I've been very fortunate that it's never been a job. I enjoy what I do. Um, I have probably averaged, averaged over 25 years, a 12-hour workday. Um, if I go home at 5 o'clock, I mean, I feel like I did something wrong. Um, but again, it's not, it's not a job for me. I like being there. I want to be there. I have a passion for it. And so that doesn't create stress for me. The other thing is having hobbies. So when I keep talking about Xbox, I, I love playing sports. So. Um, if I'm in a country that actually allows it and has it, uh, I'm a huge golfer. I used to play a lot of sports, but then again, I blew my knee out. Um, so I can't play a lot of the sports that I used to. So golf is my thing. And I mean, walking around for nine holes, 18 holes, hitting that one little white ball down the course, that lasts me for months sometimes. Hopefully, if I get out there more often. And I always tell everybody, when I grow up, that's what I want to do is actually play golf all day. Um, but it's what you make it, and it's obviously how you bring your family into it. You know, they used to have that saying, happy life, happy life. That's true. Um, it may be a little sexist, but it's true, right? If your family is happy at home, when you're coming home, you're going to have a better quality of life. And so, if you know that they're not going to be successful in Mali, 
or in Yemen, or even in Brussels or Paris, then don't take them there. Because that's just going to make two and three years more arduous than it needs to be. All right, you got a question there? Yeah. So we have a, a school as part of the State Department, it's called the Foreign Service Institute. The actual name is the National Foreign Affairs Training Center. And there, this is where they have the language classes, but then they also have the culture classes, what we call trade craft, what we call technical classes. All the soft sciences that the State Department teaches are at this location. And so before you go to a country, you sit through what we call area studies, and we talk about culture, things to do, not to do, the politics. Uh, religion, various things, how to help your family be successful. What they try to do while you're in Washington is link you to a family that's at the post that you're going to so that you have someone to communicate. They can tell you what you need to pack, what you need to have in your suitcases versus what is going to be coming in your shipment later on, maybe two or three months. They kind of give you that on the ground truth of what you know that capital is going to be like. Now for me, I kind of like the grungier places. Brussels, Brussels was nice. Uh, I probably should have gone to Brussels when I was a lot younger because they do a lot of beer in Brussels. More beer than I ever thought. Uh, but, and it was fun, it was great. But right, the electricity worked, the water worked. Traffic wasn't as bad as everybody complained about. And I was kind of used to hardship. And I kept going, this is too easy. So, but that's just me. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, yeah. <laughs> training, training has evolved for all federal law enforcement agencies. I think when I came in, the focus was on the hard skills. It was on driving, shooting, uh, investigations, how to do an affidavit, how to present to grand juries, things like that. Nowadays, we do a lot more tactical training as well as a lot more cyber training uh, for our staff. We do, a, uh, we do focus on surveillance detection and things like that. Um, I see that what, what we are teaching new agents now to do was unheard of 25 years ago when I was going through it. Um, and part of it was because when I came on, we didn't have a lot of the statutory authorities that we have today. In the last 25 years, we've been spending the last 25 years to enhance our authorities both domestically and overseas, and with that has come more responsibility, thus more training is required. Uh, and I would say Wendy's touched on it, she's the expert in this, and our training has matured so much because the world has changed for us. We are in places now, all the countries I oversee, longer than we would have ever been before 2003 when we made Iraq. Exhibition diplomacy, whatever you want to call it, we are in places now, and there's the U.S. government, largely as the State Department running the platforms, our embassies, that years ago, the threats, we would have said, hey, we're, we're gonna bring the flag down, fold it up, salute it, we'll come back and we'll stop flying. But that's not the paradigm we're in anymore. So the tactical evolution of the training basic agents get, helium exercises, medevac, I mean, performing like minor surgery almost and stuff. I mean, the medical training, it's insane. But it's because we want our people, we've learned about DAR, we've learned about Nairobi, We've learned, and I can go over embassies that were almost a run in Tunis cartoon. We saw Seoul, Baghdad just the other day. I mean, we're the host weekend in places. So I'm not worried about the host nation in Brussels. I'm not worried about the host nation in Singapore. In most of my countries in Africa and in parts of the Middle East, I am absolutely of the belief that if the DOP doesn't come rescue us, we're going to have to hold out for a long time. So that's why the training Wendy and her crew run and oversee and develop for our cadre of agents and couriers and engineers and technical specialists. I mean, we're doing things in the technical realm. You know, we, when Embassy Baghdad was attacked, we have a flyway kit that is shipped almost instantly that has temporary barriers, temporary cameras, all these things. So, because we have a lot of experience on force, our embassy is being left hanging out to dry by the US government. So, I think evolution has really been a largely, not just the side, but the tactical side to prepare our agents in a mindset, I think, as well. Well, I think when, when Greg and I came on, uh, 
when we were doing first aid, there would be this thing, I don't know if you've ever heard of rescue any. Oh, yeah. So it was, a, it was a plastic dummy that you do CPR on or something like that. But it was not very lifelike, right? Well, currently right now, our tactical med teams have buildings that move, that groan, that scream, and that bleed profusely. Like to the point I have to seal the floors now because they're staying blood. Um, so it's much more real. The, the technology has brought more realistic uh, elements to the training. When we used to do crisis management when we first came on, we could do a tabletop exercise. Tabletop exercise, you sit around a table and you kind of role play. Well, if you do this, I'll do that, da 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 da. Well, nowadays, we put people in an environment, a mini town, and we make things blow up, and we attack them, and we make them, push them to make decisions and then see what the ramifications are. They're actually having to act it out versus just sitting around role play. That changes the dynamic on your judgmental training and et cetera. So that when you actually have that bad day, that you're what we call the worst day, it's not the first time. Because we've already stressed you through that multiple times. Really helps. Yes? I mean, I don't know, to a certain way, we're driven by our foreign policy priorities, right? So we want the bad guys to get a vote. So when you have Russia, China, North Korea, other state actors, again, I'm a believer that nations don't have allies, they have interests, okay? It's real politic, but we, Wendy and I play defense. Our organization plays defense. We play a mean game of defense, and we can do it so well, it's kind of like offense in some ways, but we play defense. There are other U.S. government agencies that play offense. So when the bad guys are trying to, one, we've got to worry about um, them it used to be 20 years ago, it was the truck bomb, right? There was a 5,000 pound truck bomb blowing a hole in our wall. Now it's them shutting, stealing all of our classified and we're not classified any of our information and hacking systems doing things. So one is we're gonna be driven by what the bad guys do. What, what is the changing? Drones. The UAS threat we are trying to grapple with now is a, a real challenge for our, for our uh, counter, countermeasures folks, all our engineer good friends. I mean, can we shoot them down? Well, the military has the technology, but am I gonna do that over downtown London? Have a drone, am I gonna shoot it down and land at a school? These are real challenges for us. Do I just do I just zap it with some sort of gray or electronic EMP that knocks it down and it falls in a freaking apartment building? And it, these are real challenges. So the bad guys get a vote on where we go, right? And then there's our foreign policy. What we had in the late 90s, before Wendy joined them and I joined up until 2001, until 2003, when we are in now still Syria, Yemen, Iraq, all these places. I showed, when I was a liaison, we have some jobs outside of the SD. I was a liaison to the military for three years that covered Africa, U.S. Africa Command, Stuttgart, Germany. So I'm sitting there after our embassy, after the attack in Benghazi, and our embassy a uh, year or so later was really fortified. We had our DS agents, we had our MSD, our tactical teams, we had our Marine detachment. We had over 100 fleet Marines, like United States Marine Marines, with cruiser weapons, heavy machine guns, and javelin anti-tank weapon systems, okay? It was crazy. And this wasn't like a building we built. These were four villas we strung together and put a wall around them. So I go into a one star I worked for who was, uh, I can't kill you guys through this. He's probably the finest person I've ever worked for and he's a crazy guy. He's a remarkable guy. He was a former Delta Force guy. Sure. I am. He was, so I was just pain. I briefed him like I had to brief slow because I mean, he went to Clemson, right? So <laughs> I would hit him stuff. He goes, great, what's the embassy got there? And he's triple that, oh, I'll get the, get the info and we'll get it back. So next, I'm briefed up the next day, and he looks at me and goes, that's a goddamn file, a forward operating base. I go, yeah, you're right, there's like 10 diplomats and 150 gunslingers. We didn't used to do that. So that, those kind of events, if the foreign policy is, if the president, the secretary of state, it's probably to be there, we're gonna tell you the risks, the danger, what we think we need to mitigate and how we can try and keep you safe there. But at the end of the day, you know, we're gonna salute and move out too. So does that kind of answer your question? The bad guys get a vote in emerging technology, I think. So, does that help? So uh, for us, when we do a, what we call a permanent change of station and you do a two-year assignment, then you're, while you're there for every month, you're earning a day of leave. 
This is on top of your annual leave that you get. They call it home leave. And so when you finish that assignment, you come back to the United States, you have to come back to the continuous uh, uh, United States, and you get to use those days kind of like free of charge. Um, so if you're in a two-year assignment, you come back, you got 24 days of leave that you're actually 21 days you're required to take to kind of reactivate. Now, if you go for a temporary assignment, uh, and let's say you're doing two months, typically, yeah, no, you, you can turn around and go back. Uh, when I first joined, uh, I was assigned to our Washington field office, which we affectionately call the temporary body pool from the Secretary of State's protective detail, because they never have enough agents to handle all the travel that they're doing. So I spent the first eight months of my career just doing uh, trips with the Secretary of State. At the time, it was Warren Christopher, who has since passed. Um, and there was a period of time I went for about four months where I was only at my apartment in Virginia for five days. Because I would just bounce from time to time. You learn how to work the angles with the hotels to get your free laundry service and stuff like that. I have friends that recently are on the Secretary of State's detail and they foolishly did not listen to me when they were going through training. And they were told, yeah, you just have this one trip. You're going to go to uh, pick a location in Europe and then you're just going to come back. So they take one suit, because it was only supposed to be a three day event. I would say that's a bad choice right there. Uh, but they took a minimal amount, right? They, they, they ended up being gone for three weeks. And they ended up having to buy two suits while they were out. If this, and actually, this friend is about 6'8", and he doesn't look good in European suits. You know what I mean? But, and then he actually volunteered to do what we call midnight shift, which means you work at the hotel and you're up while the secretary's sleeping so that you don't have to look presentable to the rest of the world because the cameras are on the Secretary of State 24 7 except when we're on the hotel floor and they don't have access to us so yeah I mean it's it can be very brutal in some of our positions the the tactical team that uh, Greg was talking about our mobile security deployment teams there are times when they are going full stop all the time good supervisor you try to balance it but it's, it happens the, the Wendy's description, I think, of when she was younger in our Washington field office, they probably get the worst almost and stuff. But we liked it. We wanted yeah. it. So. But so, like, her, her tactical teams, the report to Wendy, when those guys are down to map for six day employment, they're normally going to make every effort they can to oh, get them yeah. down yeah. time. It's okay. And same thing, when you're moving from an overseas assignment to overseas assignment, you do get that break in the middle for assignments. If you're going from overseas assignment to a domestic assignment, you may get some break, maybe not as long and stuff. But yeah, I think generally you can, except for. The constant temporary ones can burn you out. You got a question in the back somewhere? Yes. Yeah, so for Beijing, because I was going for the Olympics, there wasn't very much training. I was actually coming from a domestic assignment where I was working at our dignitary protection unit. Uh, so I had maybe a week of what we would call consultations and a little bit of area studies, and I was sent out pretty quick. Uh, sometimes if you're going to a more hostile region, you may need to take uh, an advanced tactics course, uh, which could be 11 weeks. Typically that's the longest. Now language training can be anywhere from three months to a year, depending on what language it is. I mean, the hard languages like Mandarin, Russian, Farsi, those kind of things, those take uh, a year and then sometimes two years. So you have a year at FSI, and then you would do a year at post learning the language. So you had a question earlier. <laughs> OK. You got It's a uh, accredited course from the federal law enforcement community enables you to be a criminal investigator. Some law enforcement agencies, that's the only training that they will take. They will go back to their home agency and they begin working. 
For diplomatic security agents, we, after an agent class has finished at FLETC, we bring them up to the Virginia area and they go through what we call the DS basic agent course. Uh, that's an additional 12 weeks that we put them through and this is where we do. We work very much on the tactical side, a lot of on the protection side because FLETC doesn't, in a criminal investigative training program, you wouldn't expect them to talk about or teach protection. So we have to do a lot of the protection on that side. This is where we're doing a lot of motorcades, a lot of um, what we call movements, how you move protectees from buildings and cars and escalators and elevators and all the other kind of scenarios, attack scenarios, and et cetera. Um, and then we also do a little bit more on what is the unique part of the criminal investigations that DS has to do. Um, and then we talk a lot about what life is overseas. Um, because even though you may be assigned, your first assignment typically is assigned to a either a resident agent office or a field office. You typically will do that for two years. And we try to give them the skills uh, to get them acclimated as fast as possible when they arrive at their field office or their resident office. Do you have a follow up? We'll finish, we'll finish with you. And there's a specialized courses you can take, but there is required in service training. Yeah. Here's the thing so, when I first started, it actually was you did, let's see, you did the DS basic agent course, and then you didn't have any training for a period of time. And then, when you're getting ready to go overseas, you went through what we call the basic regional security officer training, which was an eight week course uh, to kind of prepare you for working in an embassy. And then you'd be overseas, no training there. And I used to describe our training patterns, you have these peaks, and then you have these really long valleys, and then you have another peak of training. And the problem is it's based on classroom. We have to bring you back and put you in a classroom, or put you out on a track or a range. Um, we are actually having to change that dynamic now. Uh, we are looking at e-learning, hybrid learning, how can we maximize getting the information and the skill sets to our employees at their desks whether they're in an embassy or a field office, and then maximize the classroom time and the range time to just the things that we can teach there so that we can actually get more people through. Uh, nowadays, agents come on, they finish FLETC, they finish BSAC, they typically go to a field office, and in about six months, they're gonna come back to the training center, my training center again, and they're gonna go through an advanced tactics and leadership um, course. We call it ATLAS. Uh, this is designed to be a very high threat, dynamic, tactical course. Um, it builds on what they had at FLETC and with us, but it's taking it to a whole nother level. Um, and then they will go finish out their assignment in domestic. They'll probably do a temporary assignment overseas once or twice while at that field office. And then they're probably going to try to bid out overseas. About half of them will be able to go overseas the first time. The other half will probably have to do another domestic assignment. Uh, and then go overseas after that. Uh, it just kind of depends on what the assignments are available overseas, unless they're willing to go to Baghdad um, uh, or Shabul or Shawar or somewhere like that. And then typically those are one-year assignments. So assignment processes within the Foreign Service, you have one-year assignments, which usually are the hard, really dangerous places that you, you go unaccompanied without your family. Two-year assignments typically are the majority of the ones around the world. Those are what we call the medium hardships, um, or your first assignments, because those can only be two years. And then the, the rest of them are three-year assignments. Uh, the neat thing is, is that once you've done three assignments with DS, you can also, if you're in an assignment and you like it, or let's say you have a child who is a junior, and you want them to finish their last high school year, so you want to extend for a third year or for a fourth year. Sometimes that is actually allowed, and they take into account family situations to kind of do that. Again, it depends on what else is going on and where those positions are, and yeah, who you know about it. Now, you're, uh, over the past, the jobs, you're bidding at your rank. You're normally trying to get a job based on your rank. Right? You can stretch a little bit, depends on a whole bunch of numbers, retirements, attrition, hiring. But normally, if you're like, what, you know, equivalent like an 03 or an 04, you're bidding on 03 or 04 jobs and stuff here. So 
the, the fact that Wendy's been on two or three years longer than me is generally, I don't want to say nine hours, so not going to have any impact, but she and I are trying to get the same job. No, we're actually on the foreign service pay scale. Uh, so we do have civil service employees in the State Department. Uh, we do have civil service agents who don't deploy overseas. Uh, and they're 1811, so the criminal investigative code, same as the civil service and the GSI. But uh, our pay scale for Greg and I is the foreign service pay scale. It's completely different. It's very hard to line up the GS scale. Um, but we essentially have the same HR benefits, so we earn leave essentially the same as any other federal agency. We earn uh, our medical and all those other benefits are line up the same. The difference is when we're overseas, uh, we do earn home leave as I was describing. Uh, we also have, because overseas, the State Department pays your housing, not for your internet, which I this day, at this stage, you think they'd be paying for that, but they pay for your water, your electricity, and everything, your rent. And then they also pay for your children to go to school uh, at whatever country you're in. And if you're in a place that doesn't have an adequate, what the State Department says, an adequate, either high school, middle school, or elementary, then the State Department will actually pay for your kids to go to a boarding school somewhere, or to actually go to school in the U.S. at a boarding school. Uh, these tend to be very very exclusive and um, well um, accredited schools around the world. A lot of the foreign service family members get a lot of benefits from, from partaking in those. I mean, your, your dollar goes very far overseas, whether you're an agent or a political officer. Um, the, our embassies are ranked around the world based on danger, hardship, and cost of living. So in Oslo, Norway, if it costs you and your family for $75 to go to McDonald's, which it does because the value of tax and all these other things, then your salary has an adjustment based on that. You're not going to get dollar for dollar, but there's a bump. If you go to Peshawar or Kabul or Baghdad for a year, you get an extra 35% because it's hard, like it's bad, breathing air quality, and a 35% danger. So that's an extra, that's like 70%. So it's 35 and 35. There's a, there's a congressional mandated cap, which is lifted in Kabul and Baghdad. Uh, for sure, and raise, take a shower. But so the Department of State really has a number of incentives that the rest of the civil service and the poor government does not. Because um, we're all overseas, and, and in many places, they're not. So, so. Next, next question, you have one back there, lady? Yeah, we, 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 we interact with them. I think our, we have certain divisions which focus on protective intelligence and counterintelligence. So as, as overseas, we may cross paths, or domestically if there's some issues, and we cross paths and do work with them. Uh, not, I mean, not so much my director, or maybe Wendy's per se, on the, the criminal investigative mission and stuff, but there may be cases that's a, a, a military spouse or employee trying to get a passport and fake identity. That's gonna be C Army CID or NCIS or Air Force OSI. We work a lot with them on force protection overseas. So whether it's in Kenya or in Saudi Arabia or elsewhere, where the military has concerns about the force protection of its troops, we are normally in an interaction. Our embassies, our ambassadors, our security, our agents, like when you and I overseas, are working with our counterparts in overseas. There's actually a lot of interaction on the force protection side. Yes. almost a GS-11 maybe equivalent, yeah. maybe? Um, and what will happen is you're, a, you're an FS-6 for 12 months, and then you are administratively promoted to uh, a, a, is there a 5 or a 4? There's 5, and then 18 and uh, yes. okay. So an FS-5, our numbers go lower instead of the GS-1 is higher. Um, and then after another 18 months, then you'll go to an FS4. So again, in each one of those, you're getting a, a, there's a pay raise in that. Now, once you graduate from 
flood scene, you also, because you passed the criminal investigative training program, you qualify for law enforcement availability pay. And that adds 25% of your salary is bumped. And that money actually goes toward your retirement as well, which is different than overtime. So when you first come on, you're entitled to earn overtime if you're not taking leave. But with overtime, so that's money that they can tax, but nothing, that overtime doesn't count toward your retirement plan. So you don't get the credit for that overtime amount. Um, so after you get your four, then you go another, I think you, so all of those are automatic. When you go from an FS4 to an FS3, you actually compete. And this is where the co competition part comes in the foreign service. So everything after your four, go into a one and then an OC and an MC requires competition. And those are based on three looks. Uh, so you have to do three years at your current grade and then you're eligible, but then you have to be recommended and then you have to be selected. And where do you start? I mean, what you said, you're an FS6, which is like just 10 or 11, whatever it is. But there's these steps, like you'd be an FS6, step one, if you have just a bare base requirements. But if you are, you have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and you work in the military for six years, and you're a cop for five years, and then you work for the CIA as an analyst for two years, you would come in as an FS6, step four, 13 or 12, you're gonna be at the high end of that, right? Because you're bringing a lot more to the table for us. Um, but if, if you come in, you know, let's say I came out of college and stuff, it would probably be lower, but so. It's, so when I joined, I came in at a FS6, step two. With a master's degree. I was a seven. And I had classmates who were retired military uh, that were in the class, and they came in as an FS uh, 6 12. So they were making more money than I was. We were doing the same work, but within three and a half years, because I got promoted to my three before they did, I was making more money than four. So you can, someone can start ahead of you, but you can pass them. Yeah. Relatively quickly. Question. Sir, in the back. So, so it's a slippery, I mean, it's a bit of a slippery thing on intelligence collection. We have our intelligence analysts and threat analysts. So we have analysts that I would stack up who study Yemen or Afghanistan or Latin America where I'd stack up with anyone. Like, so this, the military is looking at the world through the intelligence that's collected by the NSA, the CIA, whoever and stuff, and their own collection for their means. The CIA is looking at it for their means and ends. We're looking at it for threats to our embassies, our personal our facilities. So we have analysts that focus on that that are super squared away. On the non-analyst side, as far as intelligence, it is a, I don't want to say slippery slope, it's a, it's a dicey situation with us in the intelligence community. We get along incredibly well with them, but if I'm, if I say, if I go to embassy overseas and they know I'm replacing Joe, Joe is the security guy. Joe makes sure the gates are secured, the families are safe, and works the police and does investigations. If I replace Joe and I start asking too many questions in China and Beijing, and they now think I'm an intelligence officer, that is a problem. They are going to treat me like an intelligence officer, and I cannot do my job. So we uh, we do have a, a, an element called protective intelligence investigations. They kind of thread the thin needle in between traditional agent work and security work and gathering intelligence to support our ends. Right? So they're kind of, but it's, it's a. Is that the right describing it remotely well? I think it's. A, we are not intelligence officers. We are not collection officers. We're not and, part of the intelligence. And I would not try and now when and I, I meet ministers interior I meet local contacts and they tell me things and I go back and I type that up and I send them to Washington but it's called a reporting game I'm reporting it if there's intelligence value to people that's phenomenal that's fantastic but I'm not going out and trying to elicit intelligence and information from the hotel security manager of the Marriott in Shanghai that is going to be a problem and stuff so I mean but the, we're gathering information trying to pump into the larger US government community but really not the intelligence realm. Is that kind of answer and stuff? I mean, we proactively report. We cannot be tasked by the intelligence community to do collection. We're not a collecting organization. But we have to use intelligence to do exactly what Greg was talking about in terms of our protection uh, and also with our investigations as well. Uh, so uh, we have an entire career set that does threat analysis. Uh, whether it's on the protection side, the investigation side, the liaison side, and they, they will liaison with the intelligence community. Yes? Uh, 
also the student loan repayment program? Yes, so there's the student loan repayment program, uh, which pays a certain amount every year to pay off your student loans. The GI Bill uh, is still good for, I mean, if you qualify for the GI Bill, you use that the same way you can whatever federal agency or organization you're with. The only thing that we have in terms of paying off student loans is that student loan repayment program. It's been going on since I think 96, 97. Yeah. And uh, not a whole lot, but it is free money. Uh, and it varies every year because Congress gives us a certain pot of money and we have to divide it out amongst all the candidates that have applied for it. It's only, uh, so you have to be serving in what we call the hard to fill post. So you don't qualify for the student loan repayment program if you're in Paris. But if you're in Kenya, you do qualify for it. So you would apply, you have to apply each year. It's only good for one year at a time. And you have to be in good standing in paying your student loans. It's not like the government will pay it and you don't have to pay anything for the year. You're still paying, but they're just throwing in a lump sum to pay you off faster. Any more questions? You don't need any more sources. No, seriously. No, and I, I, I tell agents, I talk to them, I said that uh, if anyone joins this organization trying to think they're going to be the director, they're a narcissist and they're idiots. You have a three-legged stool. I think you've got what, you've got what our organization wants you to do. Then we're going to do our tactical teams and sort of field office and do headquarters and stuff. You got what you want to do. Hang on, I really love criminal investigations. I want to work in New York or Miami or Chicago criminal investigations. Right? So you got to balance those two. You got to work for your family. I'm incredibly fortunate in my career. My school's been very balanced. I have kids that I love to do and do anything for who had an amazing experience growing up overseas and they're better for it. I'll tell you that. My wife has put up with me. God knows why. Um, I don't think I'm going to regress. No, I don't. Yeah. Other supervisors maybe I wish I'd punched the mouth once or twice. <laughs> other than that, no, I really. I mean, it's been, there have been, I've never loathed going. There have been some days I'm like, oh my God, I'm not waiting for this meeting today and stuff. But every day, I, I, I've been doing it for 22 years, close down 23. The higher you get, as sec, former sec def and CIA director Bob Gates said, the higher you get in an organization, the more of your time you spend convincing people who disagree with you, right? So that, so we're doing more now. That is more of a drain and more challenging, but I also think we're making more of a difference. So when I was a more junior age, I dealt with problems that were significant, but they were localized and smaller. You could maybe solve them easier. It was maybe a, a, little, a little less worry and stuff. But I think Wendy and I come to work every day believing and uh, not blind naively that we're, we're making a positive difference because we care, I think. So no regrets from me, really. I mean, yeah, no, I would say, because I mean, if I had a regret, yeah, I mean, it's because we're at the level that we're at right now that I don't get to go out and participate in raids or or go jump in the bottle car behind the Secretary of State and do those kind of things because that's not my pay grade now. And I can't even bend all those assignments, uh, even though I may love it. But I'm also at a very fortunate stage now where I can affect change for this organization. And I tell people and the people that work for me and the people that are coming in that we have an obligation. You can't expect that Greg and I are going to fix the problems of the State Department. Each individual employee has to be part of the change. You have to own that change, and you have to be the change that you want. It's just now fun to be in a position where I can actually affect that change. That I used to sit around with my, my colleagues and my buddies and complain about this or complain about that. And wouldn't it be great if someone would actually listen to us? Well, the great thing about staying into an organization for 20 plus years is you get to that point where now someone's listening because it's us, and we can make that change. So you have one more? <clears throat> when you go to the assignment, do you kind of get to choose where you might go, or is it just set and you're going here, you're there? Uh, good question. Um, so, and I was explaining this to, to Brandon earlier. Uh, we go through a process that's called bidding. So depending on when you arrive, so two or three years later, at that time of your summer or the winter cycle, you will go through a bidding process and you look at all the available assignments that are going to be out there for your next assignment. And you bid on them and you can do anywhere from six to five to 15 bids. You submit those and you rank order them. This is my top priority. 
this is my lowest priority, but I'm willing to go there, right? So if you put it on your list, your brain, put more than six, number seven, don't make sure that number seven's a place you're still willing to go. Because there are a lot, a lot of times, number 15 is the place that you end up. Now, if you put in six bids and you don't get those bids, they come back to you and say, hey, all those positions are gone now, we need to put in new bids. So then you know you look what's left and you keep bidding. So you get a little bit of say, it's not directed. Now, uh, when you first join, we do have directed assignments. So when you first join, uh, we will tell you as soon as you uh, finish uh, what we call, uh, it's kind of an A100 course, like in onboarding for the State Department, we say your first assignment is going to be the New York field office. I used to work there. So you know you're in two years in New York. And then your next assignment, you get to bid, but it will be a directed bid. And by that, it means you have a very much smaller window of the positions that you can bid on. Typically, it's secretary's detail, mobile security deployment team, uh, a couple of different high, high, posts. High, yeah, high threat posts overseas. It's a small window. Rarely can you bid on Paris. Rarely can you bid on London or things like that. After that second assignment, you complete that second assignment, the word is open. There's one more hand. Yeah. yeah. Oh, over the corner. So, I mean, Wendy and I and the, the senior leadership organizers are, are, are burdened to some degree where you have what you want to do in your career, right? And if you're volunteering to go to a bad place, we, we're we normally we need people to go to those places. Well, however, we don't want you to burn out, right? I don't want you to do a cattle, a shower, Baghdad, back to back to back. 
it is a real challenge, and ultimately I'd say it's year by year. If we need somebody to go to a location accident, the chair, the music is stopped, and there's one chair on it, and you're jumping, pick me, pick me, pick me, where we go, and stuff. We may end up doing it. We don't like to. The burden on the individual is not in his or her long-term interest, but it's not in our long-term organizational interest for the mental health and well-being. Yeah, you can make a ton of money and stuff, but I mean, it's, we also want you to be more well-rounded. So, we, years ago, when I first went to Conwell in 08, when did you, you did this a lot or a bit special? Reveal. Reveal. So, years ago, we, we read the rack 2004, so, so, by 8, 9, 10, we had a lot of ages in our one year in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. By 12, 13, 14, your agents do their second time to Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. We have agents now who've done four one year tours and are seeking to do a fifth. Unfortunately, we've been at this 17, 18 years, right? So, we don't generally let them do them back to back. You're going to break it up with Washington, you're going to break it up with Thailand or somewhere, whatever it would be, hopefully, and stuff. A, a, a tour in our counterintelligence office, a tour in our countermeasures, understanding physical security, a tour in our protective intelligence, a tour in criminal investigation, a tour in Miami or Chicago or New York or wherever. But yeah, we, we are struggling with making sure we fill those places because those are where we are at the most danger of jeopardy. You need bodies. But we're going to look long and hard to let people go again and again and again for the one year. So our, our director, I think, rightfully, even we are very skeptical of that. It's a balance. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Sir? We do. We've got brochures on that. Outside. Which are where? Yep. Outside. outside. Read the brochure. At the table outside. There are multiple internship programs within the State Department. Some actually pay. Others are the summer internships. Some oh, are year long. Yep. Some are domestic. Some are overseas. Some require security clearances. Some don't. You just have to go to state.gov and look up employment opportunities and they'll have the we have the, the actual instructions out there but they have them out there. You're real. Yes. So for me when I was finishing up grad school I was looking at pretty much all of the federal law enforcement agencies, Secret Service, FBI, DEA, Marshals. Um, and I just happened to find out about DS because I had never heard of DS. Um, this is before the internet, so don't laugh at me. Um, you just had to do it by a book that was put out once a month called the Federal Register. And you would get this book and you'd look through all the vacancies in the federal government. And I just happened to be flipping through the pages and I saw this thing, it's called Diplomatic Security Service, and I was like, what the hell is that? And, uh, and then I read a little bit of it, they had like three lines that said serve overseas. And I was like, what? So I had to write off and put a stamp on an envelope and mail it to get information. And then I get this booklet and I was like, is this real? Because for me, I, I wanted to be in law enforcement, but I love to travel. Um, my grandparents traveled all over the world, uh, personal travel, not for work or military. And I kind of got the bug when I was, was young and for me, it's all great to see the Eiffel Tower, or see the pyramids, or things like that, but I wanted to experience the culture. And that would kind of have to be there longer than two weeks. So having the opportunity of taking law enforcement and living overseas was like winning the home run for me. I was the same for me too. I mean, I was freshman grad when I finished undergrad in California. I learned about DS. Yes, it was '92, '93. No one was hiring. It was the government was actually downsizing. The military was giving retirements in 15 years. So I decided to come to grad school. And while in grad school, like one day I was, I, I was interviewing and moving along the process with customs, with DEA, and with the marshals. And DS was the one, uh, it was October of 96. I remember I got the monthly criminal justice, whatever the, the, the CJCS newsletter was, uh, the FBI on the ground. Was like, and at the end of the back of it, I'm flipping through, it's like October 26th, or I don't know what it was. That's like, Diplomatic security, open application period, October 1 to 30, that's like October 27. I'm like, holy crap. You know, so I was going over to San Diego, I called my dad, I said, go to the field office, there's an office there, go get the application materials, I'll type it out in the typewriter when I'm home and stuff. So, for really, it became, uh, a, 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 you were looking for more of a child, I was a police officer in Columbia at the time, with a master's degree, which was great experience, and I loved being a cop. I felt an incredibly rewarding feeling every day, and I've been happy to do that my whole life. 
but I was fortunate to have opportunities to pursue beyond that. The federal one, of course, the money angle is a lot better, let's be honest. It's not going to be able to work out in a lot of ways. And the overseas travel side, a bachelor's in international relations and a master's in criminal justice. So now when and I are federal law enforcement officers, you're traveling with overseas. So for us, it was really that good. So what, what gives me hope is knowing that no matter where we've been overseas, people when they meet Americans and don't judge ourselves on our foreign policy and statements of never being their own propaganda, want people are the same all the world. They want a better life for their children, they want you know, clean water, clean air, and they want to live in peace and harmony. That's just my experience of everyone I've been overseas, the locals and stuff. Two things like when uh, in the late night and early 2000s when I was in Oman, we launch strikes, the U.S. Uh, military did in Syria and Khartoum and elsewhere, and there were these protests that came on the embassy in Muscat, where we lived in a lot of which was under, but my wife was eight months pregnant, couldn't travel. I had senior friends of mine in the Omani security services, and I'm like, I'm talking to my friend Abdul Akim, who's a temple engineering grad, and I said, Abdul Akim, I said, yeah, he said, are you guys good? I said, we're good, but, you know, we're contemplating order departure, sending family members out, my wife can't leave, he goes, you're alive. You know, so things like that, those kind of relationships you establish, people that are going to look out on a human level, a human level makes sense. Uh, every day we have an 8 o'clock meeting with our director and our assistant secretary where we go over the nightly intelligence and the incidents around the world. Um, what keeps me up at night? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a, I say it's a high bar at this stage. Um, you know, I, I, I think just the, the general spread um, in a lot of places of an ideology that wants nothing more than not just to attack our embassy with a truck bomb, but to slaughter our kids in our school. Um, and how do we protect our soft targets? Um, uh, that is, and, and really our men and women overseas, the agents that have fallen when these my first steps that are places we've never served, how are we supporting them? How are we helping them every day? What are we missing? Uh, when I'm waking up every day and I quit, you know, sitting, you know, getting dressed to try and go to the gym at 4 30, I'm trying to go ahead and through my phone, my emails, I'm saying spot report, more loud, more around to Mogan issue, you know, spot report, you know, a missing American citizen in Kenya, presumed kidnapped and stuff like this. I'm like, oh, you know, the, 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 the bad ones for me, the cobbles, quite frankly, Afghanistan, where we are, there's a peace process coming, we're negotiating a of weakness. Um, if you've read the Afghan papers, the Washington Post, it lays it out really well. It's, Gut wrenching. Um, you know, the fact that we're going to lose more men and women there before we declare victory and go home, that, that personally for me is what, what's pretty wrong. I don't know if I said too much there. I might be a problem. So, just to piggyback on what Greg was saying, so there are things that make us different, whether that you're Americans or you're overseas. But I'm always focused on the things that make us common. And I think Greg was touching on that. And if you take just a life perspective of, I'm going to focus on the things that make us common. So when I come overseas, um, I don't feel like a foreigner because I immediately try to identify the things that are common within me so that I can show that to my host nation. Uh, and to, so that's my hope, is that we would stop focusing on the things that divide us and make us different but that we would focus on the things that we have in common. Because I promise you, we have a lot more in common than we don't. But that's not what gets played out for me here. Um, what keeps me up at night is more of the, the black swans, is the things that, what are we not thinking about? You know, bad guys sit around chewing cot or whatever, and you know they're just trying to come up with the next horrific thing. Drones and UASs, yes, those are concerning. Uh, for me, because I'm in the training center now, it's what's going to be the next threat 10 years from now that we haven't seen yet, and then how do I plan for it in advance of it happening? Uh, now, I sleep quite well at night, so don't have to worry about that. But that's what when I come in and I talk, this, you know, State Department will run without Greg or I. But while we're there, how do we try to look 10 years ahead? And this is one of the things that I got from the Chinese when I was there. The Chinese truly think strategic. They have 
Now, the minimum plan is a 10-year plan. They have a 50-year plan, and they follow it. And the U.S. government, we should yeah, struggle to get them one or two years, right? So I'm trying to think 10 years ahead, because it'll take us that long to prepare for something. Um, but unfortunately, as much as we're going to try, I also tell my staff, sometimes 80% has to be good enough. Because if you strive for perfection, you will get bogged down in the bureaucracy, and you won't be able to finish a project or finish a, a mission. Sometimes 80% is enough. Now, don't go home and tell your parents that I said that was what your grades were going to be, right? Because it's not good enough. You need to get A's. But in life, sometimes 80% has to be enough for us to keep going. Sir, uh, I just You know, I, I really think, and I need to maybe speak to this, I mean, we look for a broad spectrum, so the form of the foreign service, right? I mean, so you have to have, uh, I think, a, part, of the, part of our exams, I know, are still American, American culture, right? Because we represent the United States abroad overseas. Um, surely we're a, we're a security and law enforcement organization, first and foremost. So, law enforcement skills, if you're a police officer, probation, parole, correction, those are going to help you as far as the application process. Again, the, like I said, we have people who are some of our most successful people that came out of college and, and Carlos and, uh, you know, we're uh, our current senior agent in Afghanistan, uh, a classmate here, a friend of mine, she sold insurance for seven years before she came to the organization. Um, she's a very senior rank in the organization. Um, I think a broad experience, certainly we are a law enforcement organization and security, so any focus on that I think is desirable. I would add a desire to serve and to live overseas are critical for the foreign service positions. Um, you can't join the foreign service and expect that you and your family are going to spend your 20 year career in the United States. I just it doesn't work that way. And I always tell uh, recruits as well as uh, incoming agents, so when we bring them on board, they bring one thing that is absolutely critical for us, and that's their integrity. And it is the only thing that they need to strive every day that when 20, 25 years later, they take it with them. And you don't let anyone jeopardize that. That's what you have to have, at least to do our job, but I think in the foreign service, as well as in the federal service, as well as just being a public servant. That's what you own your family, that's what you own the American public. I know we've gone a little bit over, but this has been fantastic. Appreciate all the time you've given us. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Brochures outside for internships at the